Latin terms, but I, it seems appropriate here. Next, please. Chen Cho did, however, do at least one portrait of a real woman, and presumably others as well. This one, which he painted in 1637, of a woman I haven't identified, I know only from a reproduction. I think it's in the Zhejiang Provincial Museum. The section of my Getty Lectures was devoted to real and imaginary portraits of women. I must put those lectures with their illustrations on my website, since it's highly unlikely now that they will ever be published in book form, as was my original intention. Next. We turn next to a major Chang Shou painting and a major controversy surrounding it. This is the work that he painted, at least I think he painted, in 1635, titled A Tall Pine and Taoist Immortal, representing the artist himself and his nephew in the landscape setting. I reproduced it in color and discussed it at length in both my Distant Mountains and my Compelling Image books. It has been for me one of the most fascinating and expressively complex of Chinese paintings. To judge it fairly and interpret it at some length has been a challenge for me. Next. But its authenticity has not gone unchallenged. Wang Guo Wang, seen here, is a notable doubter. As I recounted in one of my addenda to the first, uh, first series, uh, the one about the 1999 Authenticity Symposium at the Metropolitan Museum, Wang Go was one of the two people brought in by Wen Fong to add to the overwhelmingly anti kale forces who dominated that symposium, or at least were intended to. Next. His paper argued that the painting is impossible as a genuine Chan Hung Shou and must be a forgery. I won't try to summarize his argument, which uses both visual uh, observations and textual problems, to try to prove his case. Those of you seriously interested can read it in the symposium volume and judge for yourselves, especially after I show and talk about the painting. Wang Go, old friend, sometimes adversary, uh, is the descendant by several generations of the distinguished Qing Dynasty statesman Wang Tung He, 1830-1904, and he inherited his collection of Chinese paintings. He's also a maker of educational films. Several works by Chan Hung Shou were in his inherited collection, and he took on the role of a specialist scholar of the artist, compiling a three-volume collection of plates of his works with text. He, of course, is partial to paintings that were in his own collection, as anyone would be, and suspicious of many others. I think he was quite wrong about the 1635 self-portrait, and I will now show it and talk about it as a genuine and fascinatingly complex work by this great artist. Chen Hung Shou's inscription written in the upper right reads, Master Lotus and Nephew Han have been roaming at ease for days on end. In spring we have been intoxicated by the beauty of peach blossoms. In autumn we have contemplated the charm of the hibiscus. In summer we have stumbled through thick growths of pine. In late winter we have made verses about the whiteness of snow. In all things we looked after each other, leafing through numerous books, feeling doubly relaxed in spirit, practicing pure talk and sketching pines and rocks. If these words accord somewhat with the Tao, why should we feel ashamed to eat the three meals? And I go on to explain. The cryptic last line alludes to a passage in the Taoist Book of Zhuangzi, which points out that a man traveling only to the suburbs with, with enough food for three meals, comes back with his stomach full, while one setting out on a thousand-mile journey must carry enough provisions for three months. If one's excursions are modest, that is, one's needs will be also modest. Chun adds the date, the spring of 1635, and his signature. I've written so much about this painting, and my argument about it is so complex, and I'm not going to try to repeat it here. You can read it in my books at the library if you don't own them. Uh, it will be enough for the present purpose to make relatively brief comments as I show the slides. Okay, next. Chun's nephew takes on the role of the boy servant, who nearly always accompanies the noble scholar in old paintings of this kind of subject. Uh, but his face is more individualized, maybe caricaturing the real nephew's face, and he has flowers stuck into his hat, 
and also into the top of the covered basket that he carries, perhaps containing their provisions for their travels. He seems to hold another object, maybe a bottle of wine and the other arm, hidden behind him. Beyond that, I'll say only that the combination of high aesthetic refinement and mock heavy-handedness in the drawing is not the work of a forger. I would pretty much stake my reputation on that. Next. The same is true of the landscape setting. Shanung Shou uses a compositional device that was not uncommon in landscapes of the time, as I became aware in all my engagements with them over the decades, the device of mismatching the recessions at left and right, with the distant hills marking the horizon much higher on one side of a central mass, here are the trees, than the other. And the same is true of the painting of the rocks, made to look as though they were carved out of wood, and of the pleasant absurdity of the lined-up red leaves along the edge of the tree, each almost readable as a little smiley face. Uh, Chun draws the dian, or dots, on top of the rocks in the old traditional way, with a black blob with a touch of mineral green in the center of each one. Next. Here are the rocks and rapids at left of the figure. We can see the edge of his head on the lower right. My basic argument, to oversimplify it, is that Chun is doing a wry parody of the debased landscape style practiced by too many artists of his time and place, the great old Zhejiang region, where painting had flourished for centuries, and where this kind of painting had fallen into sharp decline. Chun Hong Shou was an educated and highly cultivated man who had attempted an official career and failed. He belonged, that is, to that great class of failed literati who produced much of the finest literature and art of the Ming. And he was forced by circumstance to live as a painter and to use styles and subjects that the market demanded. How he managed to transcend that bad situation is a subject basis to any serious study of Chen Hong Shou. Next. And here at last we see him in a detail, standing in a mock noble scholar pose at the center of this extraordinary picture, wrapped up in himself and yet projecting a powerful image outward, one that communicates, if we only read it right, all this situation of his and the bitterness he felt about it. He does this with an implicit confidence that there will be viewers who will grasp the implications of what he is doing, the kind of self-presentation he is giving them, along with others who will miss the point totally and think this is the work of a forger. I hope that by now you or most of you will have joined me in thinking that this is totally impossible. My treatment of the painting in my compelling image chapter ends with this sentence, quote, On this self-created stage, Chun stands in a pose of attempted, imperfectly realized dignity, looking almost out at us, almost revealing himself, but remaining finally closed in. He exemplifies in his person and his paintings the wide scope for individualism that late Ming society offered, the questioning or even undermining of tradition that was also possible at the time, and the dangers of both. His self-portrait, even as the work of an artist who found it impossible to make simple statements, is a painting of extraordinary honesty and self-awareness. If there is a better image anywhere in world art of the problematic situation of the intelligent and sensitive man in an absurd world, I do not know it." End quote. Wow. That young person could really write. Uh, next, please. Now you will all be made to gaze at Chan Hung Shou and be gazed at almost by him while I read my translation of his brief essay on painting uh, with which I ended my other book of that time, The Distant Mountains. I decided after making my own way tortuously through that great and uh, enigmatic age of painting to let Chan, Chan Hung Shou have, as I put it, the last word. Remember, as you listen, that basic to his dilemma was finding himself in the position of continuing a great tradition of painting, that of the Sung masters, that had fallen into heavy decline. And that, as I've said, is in some large part what this whole painting is about. The special importance of that essay, brief as it is, is that it's a rare exception to what I've called the literary, literati artists and critics controlling the press. Uh, doing all the writing that Chinese people read and that was preserved. Chan Hung Shou was able, as a learned man himself, who was not committed to the literati dogma, in fact was quite opposed to it, 
was able to articulate the situation and the artistic doctrine of the professional master. Okay, now I'm going to read uh, from Chen Long Shou's essay. Artists today do not follow the old masters, relying on a few phrases borrowed from old writings uh, to pass the official examination, that is. They embark on careers as scholar officials, perhaps attaining some trivial and transient fame for themselves. Thereupon they begin to wave the brush and do paintings. But their brushwork and ink control are not equal to the demands they place on them. And also in terms of verisimilitude, likeness that is, their paintings, alas, do not bear comparison with their subjects. And yet these men use their trifling fame as officials to offer their works uh, for criticism, expecting to be taken seriously as painters, that is. Moreover, they ridicule and criticize other older and accomplished artists. That is what makes me, old Lotus, most dissatisfied with these illustrious gentlemen. On the other hand, why is it that the professional artists of today, when they imitate Sung painting, fail through excess of artisan skill? Uh, is it because it is because they do not encompass Tang styles along with the Sung? Those who imitate Yuan styles, by contrast, fail through excess of rusticity. They do not trace these styles back to their Sung sources. If you can temper the stiffness of Sung with the harmoniousness of Tang and realize the qualities of Yuan through the order or the rightness of Sung, then you will have achieved the great synthesis. Mei Gong, that is Chun Ji Ru, that was his good friend, says, and he's quoting him, Sung artists are unable to attack fearlessly, that is to strike to the heart of things. They are not equal to the sparse or summary manner of Yuan, end quote, within the quote. But that is not a valid argument, Chun goes on. What about such Sung period gentlemen as Zhao Lingrong, Dungran, Zhu Ran, Wang Shan, Li Gunglin, Mi Fu? Can they be called too detailed or too fussy? They were the forefathers of the Yuan masters, such as Huang Gung Wang, Ni Zhan, Wu Zhan, Gao Ke Gong, Zhao Meng Fu. When the old masters, venerating tradition, established their methods, they were never other than strict and cautious. Ni Zhan's sketchy pictures, for instance, all are carefully arranged and follow the rules. The great and later generals Li, that Li Zhishun, Li Zhao Dao, Li Chang, Zhao Bo Ju, all these, even when they painted highly elaborate pictures, with a thousand gates and myriad doors, a thousand mountains and myriad streams, always gave them a harmonious air. If one regards their works open-mindedly and studies them, how can he possibly say that Sung is not the equal of Yuan? There are, to be sure, detestable painters also in the Sung. Ma Yuan and Xia Gui are really the ones who have given Sung painters a bad name. Uh, and then, last paragraph. I, old Lotus, therefore exhort these illustrious gentlemen to study the old masters and to examine Sung painting exhaustively so as to arrive at the end at Yuan. I exhort the professional artists to model themselves on the Sung masters, but entreat them also to include Tang styles in their studies. If you truly immerse your mind in this way, you will attain the true lineage of painting. When dealing with the various masters, you will recognize that this kind of brushwork comes from such and such a painter, that conception comes from such and such a painter. The, generation, the generational images will not be confused, and the artists will all be lined up in order. When, after that, you begin to paint, then you can move freely over the whole world. I, old Lotus, am now 54. My hometown, the Chentong, lacks any artist who can revive the study of painting. I wipe my eyes and I wait for one to appear. Okay, that's the end of Chun Hong Shou's remarkable essay. Okay, now we go on. I introduce the next Chun Hong Shou painting we'll look at with these two photos.